Well, hello, and a huge welcome to all of you to the Blavatnik School of Government. Those of you who are here in the room, we're all thrilled to be back in person. And the many hundreds of you who are online across different countries of the world. Um, I'd like to open today with a very special note of welcome, first to our colleagues and friends in the Inamori Foundation in Tokyo. Uh, you just saw uh, Dr. Kazuo Inamori, the founder and creator of this prize. Uh, Shinobu Inamori Kanazawa, the chair of the Inamori Foundation, and Hime-san, the secretary general of the foundation. It's a thrill to have you with us, even if we can't have you this year with us in person. A warm welcome also online to our Vice Chancellor Louise Richardson, who you just saw, and to Ambassador His Excellency Hayashi, Hayashi Hajime uh, from Japan. We're thrilled to have you involved um, in these, these lectures. As I said in the video, it's a very exciting moment for us in a school of government to just pause each year and think about what extraordinary things are possible in the domains of basic science, advanced technology, philosophy, and thought in communities that have enough government to make that possible. And it just reinforces and underlines for us why making sure there's enough government to make that possible is so important. I want to say a huge congratulations to all three of the laureates we're celebrating today and tomorrow. Robert Roder, who we're going to hear from in a moment, Andrew Yao, who I know some of you already heard from at midday today in a special workshop, and Bruno Latour, who we'll hear more from um, over these next two days. Um, one of the fun things for this School of Government about hosting these uh, laureates is that it gets us to invite our most distinguished colleagues from other departments to lead and take part in these events and so it's a particular pleasure today to welcome Professor Xin Lu, who's director of the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research um, here at Oxford. She's a fellow of the Royal Society. She's a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences of the Royal Society of Biology, a fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists. I could go on. Um, Professor Xin Lu is quite simply one of the most distinguished researchers in the world, particularly in the area of tumor suppression. And Professor Shin Lu, what an honor to have you here today to introduce our Kyoto Prize laureate, Bob Roder. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And it is my great pleasure and an honor and privilege to introduce Professor Roder to you all as a as the laureate of basic science of 2021 Kyoto Prize. Bob is an internationally renowned scientist and in his groundbreaking discoveries have impacted all our lives. Bob was born in Indiana and he loves to study and work in places associated with Washington. So he got his PhD in University of Washington in Seattle and um, started his own gro group in Washington University in Baltimore. You can see the pattern there. Within one year, Bob was promoted from associate professor to food professor, which is a record. And um, Bob currently is a professor of uh, Arnold Marble Beckman Biochemistry and Molecular Biology in Rockefeller University, and he has been there for quite some time. He is not just only a scientist, he is a wonderful teacher, a mentor, a colleague, and a friend. And many of his former trainees and colleagues and friends are all among the audience today, and I'm delighted to be able to have this opportunity to celebrate his achievements today. As you know, genes in our genome will have to be first transcribed into RNA and then translated into protein and to perform cellular functions to decide cell fate. 
the fate of an organism and the fate of our future and our health. And to do this, the very first step is we need to understand how DNA is transcribed into RNA. This is a very fundamental question in biology and Bob's pioneer discoveries answered this fundamental question and then his discovery has it impacted in science, biomedicine and our lives. There are many discoveries Bob's made and then his recognition and prizes is a very long list. It will take me another lecture to read them all to you. So what I would like to do is really just highlight the very few. And then the first I would like to highlight his discoveries. The first discovery Bob made was discover and characterize and isolate three most important enzymes, and that's RNA polymerases and transcribe DNA into RNA. That's polymerase one, polymerase two, and RNA polymerase three. Subsequently, Bob set up an in vitro system to allow the study of transcription. And importantly, follow up. He discovered many important components of the transcription machinery. It is through Bob's groundbreaking discoveries we now understand how a gene is transcribed and um, it's a controlled, a DNA is transcribed and gene is expression is controlled. Bob's contribution have been recognized by many prizes and awards. And um, he is a member of National Acad Academy of Sciences of US a member of American Association of Advanced, Advancement of Science, American Academy of Arts and Science, and he's also a foreign member of EMBO. Bobby is a laureate of many prizes and awards, including, but not limited to, Gertner Foundation Prize and Louis Gross Horwitz Prize, the Albert Lasker Prize, most important of all, and we are all gathered here today to congratulate Bob and celebrate his achievement and as a laureate of the Basic Science um, Laureate of 2021 Kyoto Prize. Please join me, give a round of applause to welcome Bob to the stage and to deliver his uh, Kyoto Prize lecture. Welcome, Bob. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Dean Woods, for the warm welcome, and thank you, Professor Liu, an old friend of many years, uh, for the kind introduction. I'm really truly honored to receive the 2021 Kyoto Prize in Basic Science, and I graciously thank the Inamori Foundation uh, for this really remarkable award. I also applaud the Blavatnik School of Government for their efforts through this symposium to promote the ideals of the foundation and the accomplishments of the laureates, especially to the inspired younger generation who are just formulating their own goals. So I will first uh, briefly describe my scientific area and a little personal background before elaborating major scientific discoveries over my 50 plus years in biological research. It is often stated that we are our genes, but perhaps more accurately, we are the products of our genes. According to the central dogma, DNA containing the genetic information is transcribed, that is copied into RNA, which is then decoded, translated on the ribosome to produce proteins with various enzymatic, structural, and regulatory functions. Remarkably, embryonic stem cells containing a complete set of genes give rise to different cell types with the same set of genes. Related, the normal 
formation and function of different cell types, and many associated pathologies result from differential gene expression, which is controlled primarily at the level of transcription. This makes it critical to understand the mechanisms that regulate transcription, and this has been my major objective, indeed my passion, for 50 years. Transcription is carried out by an enzyme called RNA polymerase. And this slide summarizes transcription in prokaryotes as a frame of reference for transcription in eukaryotes that I will describe. In essence, transcription is carried out by a single RNA polymerase bound to promoter elements and is regulated by gene-specific activators that interact with the polymerase. As in eukaryotes, Transcription by the polymerase initiates at a specific site and synthesizes a complementary RNA copy of the template. As a preview, my major discoveries and achievements include the polymerases 1, 2, 3, their distinct structures and functions, corresponding general initiation factors, the prototype gene-specific transcriptional activator, general and gene-specific co-activators, causal roles for chromosomal histone modifications in transcription, and biochemically defined cell-free systems that accurately transcribe specific genes to facilitate detailed mechanistic studies. But before discussing details, a little personal background. I was, I was born and raised on farms in southern Indiana near the towns of Boonville, where Lincoln learned the law through his uh, visits to the county courthouse and near the town of Jasper, Indiana. My parents had limited formal educations, but were caring parents who taught their children to be honest, humble, and diligent. And although diligence in school studies was expected, education beyond high school was not considered and I was expected to remain on the family farm. This uh, slide shows uh, a family outing on a Sunday afternoon in 1946 near the Lincoln Boyhood National Monument. Lincoln migrated from Kentucky through Indiana on his route to Illinois. Note in this photograph that my older brothers and I lower left in overalls typically worn by farm boys. This slide shows me learning to drive a tractor in anticipation of future farm work. As a child, I had little exposure to science per se, but I enjoyed trying to figure out how small mechanical devices worked and also building small devices such as crystal radios, electric motors, model airplanes, and so on. In this regard, one of my more memorable and fascinating childhood experiences was seeing a museum exhibit of Leonardo da Vinci drawings and especially models of his futuristic machines, markedly stimulating my own imagination, and also long before I appreciated his art. In high school, I was especially interested in mathematics and chemistry, and this slide shows me at the first of my many lab benches over 50 years, and this was a shared lab bench. Uh, and although I had little time for extracurricular activities because of extensive farm chores, I did manage to convince my parents to let me play football. This is a photograph of my high school football team. I am in the front row, number 33, the team captain. Fortunately, with both a strong academic record and some football prowess, I received a full tuition scholarship to attend Wabash College, a small liberal arts, all-male college in Indiana with strong scientific departments. Although I had a primary interest in chemistry, I also became intrigued by biochemistry and the emerging molecular biology during a course taught by a new assistant professor, shown here, Tom Cole, from Caltech. I was especially influenced by the classic 1961 Jacob Monod paper on gene regulation in bacteria, leading me to think about future studies on gene regulation in animal cells. 
These interests led me to a graduate program in biochemistry at the University of Illinois. At Illinois, I joined the laboratory of Bill Rutter, shown here, an inspiring mentor working on aldolase enzymes and pancreas development, albeit not transcription. Fortunately, he allowed me to initiate studies on transcription, which began after the lab moved to the University of Washington in Seattle in 1965. At the time, virtually nothing was known about gene regulation in animal cells, except that, as in bacteria, there were three major classes, messenger, ribosomal, and transfer. My initial studies focused on quantitative measurements of total RNA synthesis in isolated nuclei and in cells during hormonal responses in rat liver and during sea urchin development. However, it was not yet possible to monitor specific gene products in those pre-cloning days. So I decided to go to the heart of the transcription problem and to first identify the enzyme that transcribes DNA in animal cells. As detailed later, this led to my discovery of RNA polymerases 1, 2, 3. This was a true eureka moment in my career, and it also guaranteed me a noteworthy thesis. For postdoctoral studies, I joined the laboratory of Don Brown, another inspiring mentor, who had purified from frogs, green frogs, the large ribosomal RNA genes that I suspected were transcribed by Paul I because of co-localization in the nucleolus. Surprisingly, I failed to see specific transcription of these genes by the purified enzyme, which led me to suspect that eukaryotic transcription would be more complicated than imagined and set the stage for subsequent studies in my own lab at Washington University, St. Louis. Returning to my graduate work and regarding the isolation and identification of the eukaryotic RNA polymerases. Uh, in 1959 to 1960, Sam Weiss showed NTP-dependent RNA synthesis, both in isolated nuclei and in a derived chromatin aggregate. In 64 to 69, several labs reported only a single chromatographic peak of RNA polymerase activity, suggestive of a single enzyme but they had employed low salt, low yield extraction procedures. In my own thesis work, I realized that unlike the bacterial situation, most of the RNA polymerase was chromatin bound, that is engaged, and I systematically developed new extraction purification procedures that included isolation of cell nuclei, high salt sonication, to dissociate the histone DNA and polymerase DNA RNA complexes, dialysis to low salt to precipitate DNA histone leaving quantitatively solubilized RNA polymerase. And then finally, ion exchange chromatography to chromatographically resolve the three polymerases from several different organisms. The slide shows uh, my thesis in my laboratory notebooks with volume 12 containing the record for the identification and initial characterization of the RNA polymerases. The slide shows me collecting sea urchins, the organism in which polymerases were first discovered. This slide shows images at some of the sea urchin developmental stages uh, that I analyzed in my work. It was very beautiful to actually watch the development cell by cell, stage by stage under the microscope, but I always, of course, wondered what was going on in those cells. And this uh, slide shows the chromatographic resolution of the three nuclear RNA polymerases in February of 1969, with the red line showing the individual RNA polymerase peaks that were evident uh, upon chromatography. So this work in the fifth year of my graduate education resulted in my first publication, a Nature article. But you may note the paper was submitted to Nature on August 5th, 1969, and initially rejected on the grounds that it wasn't of general interest. Happily, 
It was published two months later as originally submitted. No revisions. The identification of the distinct RNA polymerases in 1969 was clearly foundational, but as you will hear later on, just the tip of the iceberg, as discussed uh, 20 years ago in my Lasker Award commentary entitled The Transcriptional, The Eukaryotic Transcriptional Machinery, Complexities and Mechanisms Unforeseen. And also in a recent uh, review entitled 50 Years of Eukaryotic Transcription, An Expanding Universe of Factors and Mechanisms. So having three enzymes, the next task was to identify specific RNA polymerase function. For these analyses, I took advantage of the mushroom toxin alpha amanitin, and these studies were based on comparisons of the differential alpha amanitin sensitivities of the purified enzymes, shown by the dashed lines, with the sensitivities of the synthesis of specific RNAs by the endogenous template-bound polymerases in isolated nuclei, and it was very clear that POL2 synthesized the pre-messenger RNA, POL3 the tRNA 5S RNAs, and POL1 the ribosomal RNAs. These results are summarized in this slide again with three enzymes with different specificity to synthesize or transcribe the major classes uh, of RNA. This scenario is distinct from that in prokaryotes, which as I mentioned, have a single enzyme for all classes of RNA, but it provides a convenient mechanism for the independent regulation of the global synthesis of the major classes of RNA, for example, during growth state changes. These results were also important because they allowed investigators, and particularly me, to focus on specific polymerase gene combinations in the early attempts to reconstitute specific gene transcription in a test tube with purified components. So given these uh, findings, the next question was to assess the structural basis for the distinct RNA polymerase functions. In 1970 to 71, the Rudder and Chambon laboratories reported distinct but incomplete multi-subunit structures for polymerases one and two from rat liver and calf thymus. In my own lab, my students and I purified to homogeneity, PALS one, two, and three, from mouse tumor cells. In our initial chromatographic an electrophoretic analysis, shown here in the left panel from 1974, made clear that these enzymes have complex and distinct subunit structures. By 20 years later, the laboratories of Young and Sentinac had purified the yeast polymerases, which are highly related to the mammalian, cloned the individual subunits. And the sequence analyses of those, uh, of those data, of those subunits, revealed quite clearly that these three enzymes, enzymes have some common subunits, some unique subunits, and some subunits the blue ones, for example, that are related to each other and to subunits in the bacterial enzyme that was first purified by Richard Burgess in 1969. So these results revealed a molecular basis for some common enzymatic properties, as well as the distinct specificities and regulation of the enzymes. So given the distinct enzyme structures and functions, the next task was to establish accurate transcription of specific genes by purified RNA polymerases for mechanistic analyses. The basic objective being to reproduce in vitro in a test tube with purified components the transcription events that happen in living cells. Our initial studies from 69 to 78 were quite disappointing incubation of cloned genes, which were available by that time, with purified polymerases, led to no specific transcription at all. But as an important stimulus for further studies, we had demonstrated in 1977 that a purified polymerase 3 could accurately transcribe endogenous 
five srna genes in isolated chromatin and those results are shown here this little band represents the specific transcript that was observed so these studies said our purified polymerase was indeed functional and also that there were essential, in this case, chromatin-associated accessory factors. By 1979, we had shown accurate transcription of cloned 5S genes by the purified Pol3 with an extract of soluble factors derived from the oocyte chromatin. In the panel on the right, in the presence of a purified polymerase in this extract, we saw a robust and specific transcription of the 5S genes. So we now had a functional polymerase, essential soluble factors, and we also could show that this transcription was highly specific for RNA polymerase 3 as expected. In the same year, we could also demonstrate accurate transcription of cloned gene DNA templates by purified Pol2 with soluble factors uh, present in a human HeLa cell extract. In this case, we used a fragment of the adenovirus major late promoter, and when this was incubated with a well-defined natural initiation site, so incubation of this DNA with polymerase II and a HeLa extract gave an RNA transcript that was shown to be initiated at the proper site. This transcription was inhibited by alpha amanitin, which inhibits the Pol2, and it was not seen if the extract was omitted. We had identical results when we analyzed transcription from the cell-specific beta globin uh, gene promoter. And these results uh, uh, led to an important point. Red blood cells are actively transcribing uh, Globin genes, HeLa cells, cancer-derived cell line, show no, gle no globin gene transcription, yet extracts from those HeLa cells showed an active transcription of globin genes. And that si similar situation for the adenovirus gene that I mentioned, which normally requires viral proteins in the cell. So these results led to the prediction and the later discovery of general initiation factors a general repression mechanism, for example, chromatin, for all genes, and gene-specific transcription factors to reverse the repression. Given the ability of these cellular extracts to mediate specific transcription by the purified enzymes, the next task was to identify biochemically the essential active factors in these extracts. So as I mentioned, uh, we identified cell extracts that could lead to specific transcription of these purified clone genes uh, by the polymerases two and three. In 1980, the chromatographic fractionation of the HeLa cell extracts through three different chromatographic steps led to the resolution identification of two general initiation factors 3B and 3C for Pol3 transcribed genes, as well as a gene-specific factor, TF3A, that I will describe later. In the case of genes transcribed by polymerase II, the fractionation led to the identification of four partially purified factors that were later resolved into six independent factors by studies in my own lab and in the other labs indicated here. By 1992, studies in my own and other labs here for Pol3 genes and studies in my own and other labs here for the Pol2 factors had completely resulted in the complete purification of these factors and in the cloning and validation of the individual subunits in those factors. This slide shows a simple example of the fractionation scheme used to partially purify the factors uh, for RNA polymerase II transcription. The upper right panel shows some of the purified, shows the purified factors to indicate uh, both simple and complex subunit structures, altogether about 44 distinct polypeptides. And the panel on the lower right simply shows that transcription by Pol2 with these 
uh, of a specific gene requires all of these factors. So having identified the general initiation factors, the next task was to establish the mechanisms involved in specific transcription initiation. And this led to the discovery of the stepwise assembly of the, initi of the initiation factors and the RNA polymerases into pre-initiation complexes. So the panel here shows this pathway for a gene transcribed by POL3. In the case of the tRNA gene, the internal promoter is recognized by TF3C, which in turn result, interacts with and results in the stepwise assembly of TF3B and POL3 into a functional pre-initiation complex that contains about 25 polypeptides. In the case of genes transcribed by POL2, we observed similar principles in our earliest studies we showed that the initiation factor TF2D through the TBP subunit recognized the core promoter element, in this case, the TATA element. Subsequent studies in my own and other laboratories, in particular the Sharp, Garanti, and Reinberg labs, showed the stepwise assembly of these factors uh, to form the pre-initiation complex indicated here. And again, Incubation of these pre-initiation complex with the nucleoside triphosphate precursors resulted in specific initiation and elongation. So the next seminal event in this journey was the discovery of gene and cell-specific transcriptional activators. These were predicted based on precedent from the bacterial studies and the promiscuity that I mentioned earlier of the general transcription machinery necessitating some mechanism to achieve gene and cell-specific transcription. The first of these factors was the 5S gene-specific TF3A, the prototype DNA-binding transcriptional activator in eukaryotes. Purified in 1980 on the basis of a functional transcription assay and shown to bind and activate the 5S RNA gene. The panel on the left shows that in the transcription assay with polymerase, 3B and 3C, the tRNA gene is robustly transcribed in the absence of TF3A, but transcription of the 5S gene absolutely requires the presence of TF3A, as shown here. The panel in the center shows the purified uh, TF3A analyzed electrophoretically, and the panel on the right, using a DNA footprint assay, shows the site-specific binding of this protein to the promoter of the 5S RNA gene. So following these 1980 studies on the functional identification of, pure, of TF3A, by 1984, we had cloned the corresponding uh, cDNA N gene, which represented the first, uh, allowed us to view the first protein sequence of a transcription factor. And that sequence was used by Aaron Klug to deduce the so-called zinc finger motif, which is the most abundant DNA binding motif in eukaryotic transcription factors. Mechanistically, we showed, as I mentioned, the TF3A bound to the internal promoter of the 5S gene, and this in turn resulted in the binding of TF3C, which on this particular T gene does not bind by itself, and TF3C in turn recruits TF3B in polymerase 3 as described for the tRNA gene. So this represents the first defined mechanism of action for any gene-specific transcriptional acti activator in eukaryotes, and it's distinct from the prokaryotic mechanisms that involve direct activator polymerase interactions. In the next four years, half a dozen labs, including my own, uh, studies in half a dozen labs had resulted in the identification of four gene-specific transcription factors for POL2. Currently, there are thought to be about 1,600 of these, and they are typified by a DNA binding domain, which targets them to specific genes, and by a so-called activation domain that somehow stimulates transcription on the target genes. Many of these 
factors are master transcriptional regulators, regulators of cell fate and differentiation. Some of those are summarized here. In 1987, the Weintraub lab showed that ectopic expression of myOD in a fibroblast could convert it into a muscle cell. Yamanaka in 2006 showed that four factors expressed ectopically in a fibroblast could convert it into a pluripotent stem cell. Remarkable studies that resulted in the Kyoto Prize and the Nobel Prize amongst others. So these studies emphasize both the physiological significance and especially the power of transcription factors, the, uh, their ability to change cell fate. Given their extreme biological significance, the next, next task was to establish the mechanism of action of gene and cell-specific activators. So I mentioned there currently are 1,600 or so of these. So the question here is, how does this factor bound here stimulate the formation and function of the pre-initiation complex on the target gene? Surprisingly, the activators fail to function with highly purified POL2 and initiation factors. Functional biochemical assays in several labs, including mine, then identified essential co-activators in the early 1990s. So this slide introduces these so-called cofactors that operate directly on the general transcription machinery. They include the TBP-associated TAF subunits of TF2D that were identified in Drosophila, in the Tesian lab, in human cells, in the Rader and Burke labs. They include this 30 subunit mediator complex, probably the major co-activator for activator communication. These were identified in the Young and Kornberg labs in yeast by genetic and biochemical assays and shown to interact directly with RNA polymerase II. The mediator was identified in human cells in my laboratory through interact biochemically through interactions with transcriptional activators. Another observation we made uh, was the identification of OCA B, highly B cell specific uh, transcriptional activator operating only in B cells. In contrast to those, and, and it's the first actually of a larger uh, growing group of cell specific cofactors that are being identified. In contrast to the cell specific factor, the TF2D TAFs and the mediator are ubiquitous and generally required for activator function. And I'll show you an early biochemical experiment to make that point. This is an assay with the polymerase and the general initiation factors in the mediator and an activator. So using TF2D with the other general initiation factors, there is a basal activity that's unaffected by the activator addition or unaffected by the mediator, but both together give a clearly observable robust enhancement of transcription. If the experiment is repeated with the Tata binding polypeptide in place of the parental TF2D, there is only a basal transcription observed even with the activator and the mediator present. So this experiment shows that activator function requires both the mediator and at least some of the TAF subunits. And it's a typical biochemical assay that we've used over the years to identify and investigate the mechanism of different factors. This slide shows a little more detail on the mediator, which basically acts as a bridge between enhancer-bound activators and the general transcription machinery to facilitate formation and function of this pre-initiation complex. Our early studies involved analysis of nuclear hormone receptors, such as the thyroid receptor or the PPAR gamma. We showed that interactions of the TR with the mediator were mediated by the MED1 subunit through these domains indicated here. So this is the model based on biochemical assays. The model was validated by a MED1 knockout in a cell-based model 
of PPAR gamma dependent adipogenesis. Mouse embryo fibroblast, as first shown in the Spiegelman lab, can be induced to form adipocytes with several inducing factors in conjunction with the master regulator of adipogenesis, PPAR gamma. The differentiated MEFs are shown here with the fat globules being stained by oil red O, and as shown in the panel on the right, the MEFs lacking MED1, while they grow normally, simply cannot differentiate. These experiments also showed an impaired PPAR gamma target gene expression. So this analysis basically provided more physiological relevance for the biochemically defined mechanism, and in particular, the role of the MED1 subunit uh, here of the mediator. In terms of the TF2D and the associated, uh, the TBP associated factors or the TAFs, uh, our studies here showed that E proteins, which are involved in B cell development, can interact with TF2D to facilitate the recruitment, that is the binding to the core promoter. And we showed simply that a small activation domain in the E proteins interacted with TF2D through the TAF4 subunit through a so-called TAF homology domain. So these studies actually extended our earlier studies in 1985 and 1988 that first showed physical and functional interactions between activators and TF2D, as well as other studies that showed activator TAF interactions, but no functions or mechanisms. In the case of the B cell coactivator alka B, we had shown biochemically that it was a coactivator for immunoglobulin genes. Uh, through interactions with a factor called OCK2. We showed genetically with mice that it was required for the formation of germinal centers, which are necessary for immune responses in secondary lymphoid tissues. And here is an image showing germinal center formation in normal mice, but the absence of germinal centers in uh, mice that lack, uh, that lack Oka B in B cells. We showed that Alka B activates key B, C, key B cell genes, such as BCL6, which encodes a master regulator of B cell differentiation. And we showed that it acts through an interaction of the mediator in association with OCK2, the DNA binding component, and another coactivator found in B cells, MEF2B. And what we have shown, especially in the late, very late study, is that this interaction involves the mediator and through the MED1 uh, subunit. So this indicates a, a more complex network of coactivator interactions. Given their natural location within cells, we next analyzed transcriptional regulation of genes in the more natural context of chromatin. So as is well appreciated, genomic DNA is wrapped up in a nucleosome structure through interactions with so-called core histone octamer containing two molecules each of H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. And that sort of 11 nanometer beads on a string a fiber can be folded into higher structures and ultimately into chromosomes. And remarkably, the N-terminal tails of these histones uh, can be modified by cellular enzymes uh, through acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, ubiquitylation, and others at specific sites. So this introduces a, another class of coactivators, the ATP-dependent chromatin remodelers and the histone-modifying factors which generate the modifications that I described. These factors were discovered by several other laboratories, but we were interested in using them to integrate their functions with the other cofactors that we have been studying that interact directly with the transcriptional machinery. The strategy was simply to take DNA templates and to assemble them into chromatin. And an important point to make here is that studies in the Luce lab, my former postdoc, uh, studies in my own lab, and studies in the Kornberg lab showed that assembly of the, D the DNA template into chromatin resulted uh, 
in an inactive structure that was refractory to the Pol2 and its initiation factors, which otherwise were promiscuous on the DNA templates, as I mentioned earlier. The, nano, the idea then was simply to use these chromatin templates in conjunction with the polymerase, initiation factors, cofactors, either in a nuclear extract or, or purified, in conjunction with activators and chromatin modifying factors to study activation mechanisms. Some early studies here in the Katanaga and Workman labs actually showed uh, functions of histone acetyl uh, transferase uh, in, in transcription from chromatin templates. The system that we have used in recent years, a, a more detailed description is shown here, a DNA template with a promoter and enhancer sites is assembled into chromatin with bacterial, with histones expressed in bacteria in association with a histone chaperone and an ATP dependent remodeler, according to the procedure developed by Jim Katanaga. This chromatin template, which is shown here by, in this atomic force microscopy picture, is then incubated with activators, acetyl methyltransferases to facilitate chromatin modifications. And that transcription is allowed to take place either in a crude nuclear extract or in a highly defined system with the polymerase initiation factors, cofactors like the mediator and elongation factors. And that's the most advanced system that we currently use. Now the advantage of this system is you can use because we use recombinant histones, they can be either wild type or they can be mutated in the modification sites or they can be pre-modified to, to introduce the chemical modification. And this allowed us to establish causal effects of histone modifications as well as direct effects and mechanisms uh, of coactivators. So this slide summarizes some of the earlier studies and in studies almost 20 years ago, we studied the acetyl transferase P300 in conjunction with two arginine methyltransferases that give the modifications indicated here. In later studies, we analyzed P300 in conjunction with two histone 3 lysine 4 methyltransferase uh, complexes that result in marks for transcriptional activation. These studies showed ordered cooperative interactions and functions in transcription by the tumor suppressor P53. And importantly, they established causal effects of histone modifications. And that was by virtue of the fact that mutations in the modified histone residues eliminated the coactivator functions and pre-incorporation of modified histone into chromatin stimulated transcription in the absence of the coactivators which normally deposit those marks. Now, these studies were uh, critical since we in 1997 and later many others showed that histone modifying factors can also functionally modify many transcription factors. And the common cell-based and genetic assays only show correlations of histone modifications with transcription and do not in themselves identify the essential substrates. They may tell you that the enzymatic activity is required, but they do not tell you how it's required. So I'll show you a couple of examples before closing. In this analysis, we were analyzing P53 and P300 dependent transcription from chromatin templates, and that's the activity that's seen. It's not seen if you leave out P300, it's not seen if you leave out P53. We then introduced lysine to arginine mutations in the core histones to prevent acetylation. Mutations in H2A and H2B made no difference, but mutations in the common acetylation sites in H3 and H4 had dramatic effects on transcription. So this provided basically the first formal proof that histone acetylation modifications could be causal for transcription. In this analysis, uh, we've used the other approach of introducing pre-modified histones into the chromatin template. So here, in this case, we're looking at P53, P300 dependent transcription and its stimulation by the SET1 complex that 
introduces K4 methylation, and you can see the complex enhances transcription. If we use recombinant chromatin templates that have the semi-synthetic H3K4 trimethyl analog, the P53, P300 transcription is stimulated in this experiment about fourfold without the coactivator, and adding the coactivator doesn't enhance the activity. So this experiment, again, so provides direct evidence that this modification, in this case trimethylation, can enhance transcription. So as a summary of our principal discoveries and achievements, again, structurally and functionally distinct RNA polymerases, cognate general initiation factors, gene and cell-specific transcriptional activators, general and gene cell-specific coactivators, related mechanisms through the use of biochemically defined transcription systems, and a chromatin-based general repression mechanism, including causal roles for histone modifications in transcription. So this, uh, this image gives you just a sort of simple overview of this. Transcriptional activators provide the primary level of transcriptional control, but their effects are mediated through dozens of different co-activators that provide a, a secondary level of control, and their ultimate functions are manifested through uh, the RNA polymerase, in this case RNA polymerase II, and the general uh, transcription machinery. So these discoveries, in my view, have been foundational for subsequent and functional studies of high-resolution X-ray cryo-EM studies of the Paul 123 transcriptional machineries for cellular genomic analysis of gene activation mechanisms, for live cell imaging studies of gene activation mechanisms, for mechanisms underlying distal enhancer promoter interactions and functions, the emerging role of phase separation, that is the formation of biological condensates uh, in gene activation, transcriptional regulatory circuits, and uh, importantly also, the molecular basis and therapeutic manipulation of aberrant transcription factor functions and transcriptional regulatory circuits found in many human pathologies, development, cancer, diabetes, and so forth. So I'd like to end by acknowledging uh, my undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral mentors, my many colleagues in this very fascinating transcription field, my family who unfailingly supported my dedication and passion for science, over 100 graduate and postdoctoral trainees, some of my extraordinary student and postdoctoral trainees uh, are shown in this photo, uh, on my 70th birthday celebratory symposium last year, oh, sorry, 2012. Um, and finally, I'd like to again acknowledge the Inamori Foundation and the Blavatnik School of Government uh, for the opportunity to receive this prize and to speak to you today. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I'll take that. I guess. Uh, That's your pen. <laughs> so, it's fantastic lecture. And um, now it's time for questions. And I guess I should see whether there's any questions from online. But uh, I welcome any questions on the audience. Yes, please. Uh, Good afternoon, my name is Federico and I'm a student in diplomacy and a newly admitted student at the Blavatnik School for the class of 2023 and I come from El Salvador. My first question for you is, you know, most of us see a sea urchin and we observe its intricate spines and maybe even appreciate the orange color of in its tear and taste it. It seems to me that you have a superpower of seeing at the molecular level all these invisible rules that, that you've discovered that govern how information is processed, transmitted, and multiplied. From a philosophical perspective, observing life from these lens, how, 
what lessons, what has, how has your human experience been affected, you know, in the way that you relate to society and how you observe life in general after observing such intricate beauty in the way that these processes take place? I, well, first of all, I think the experiments are driven by an innate curiosity, above all, to understand how things work. Of course, in the society we live in, we want to see these results applied to the betterment of humankind, whether it's through solving health problems or environmental problems or, or whatever. But uh, it's easy to get caught up in your own science, as I do. Uh, but thinking about the broader picture and the contributions to society, humanity, uh, are obviously an important part of it. And I think we're still at the beginning of understanding molecular details and the ability to translate that into health problems uh, and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer all of your question. How it's affected me as a human being, it's just uh, for me the issue is curiosity about how things work and seeking truth and hoping uh, society in general understands the benefits of the science for society. And my second question is, I want to live well beyond 100 years. I hope to look as good as you when I'm <laughs> like your age. And um, with such a toxic environment that, that we live in, with all the climate disasters that we're traversing, it, DNA damage is inevitable in the way that we lead our experience in, in cities. Uh, you know, we have mold exposure, we have you know, more DNA damage through sun, through air quality and pollution. Um, what challenge you are still fearful for our generation as we see climate catastrophes around the world and what role may we students of policy, policy play and what should we be paying more attention to right now? I think the biggest challenge is to educate the public in general to understanding science, to understanding uh, evidence and what it means and not to think about science as, as, as something that you can make your own opinion about. You have to understand the science and appreciate it. But uh, uh, I think education is the key. And I think scientists also need to get a broader, not only educate the public in general about the importance of science, truth in science, evidence-based science, and what it can tell you about the current state of affairs and the future. I mean, climate change, health, food, energy. Um, but we have to uh, try to understand everybody's opinions and I think um, educate everyone, including ourselves. Okay, well, there's a question in the front. For some reason, I don't see any questions from the <laughs> online, so maybe I, I just need to make. Out. I just need to make sure. No, there's a lot of questions on the audience, but well, not anything on the online. So just make sure I'm working okay. <laughs> Sorry, let me just. Yes. Um, yes, my name is Miriam Mendes. I work here at the Blavatnik as well. And I used to be a molecular biologist a long time ago. And what I was curious about was that there was what I thought was a long period in which after you, you, you um, discovered the three polymerases, you couldn't make the thing work in vitro. How did you go through, the, through that period? How did you keep people going and how did you keep yourself going and also the grants coming to pay for your failed attempts? Um, it's a great question. It was definitely frustrating. Everyone, including me, thought, because in 1969, the individual studying bacterial polymerase could show that the bacterial polymerase could initiate transcription on specific template. They had to have the sigma, so-called sigma factor there. So uh, we thought it might be easy. I thought it would especially be easy for RNA polymerase one. It has only one gene that it transcribes, the ribosomal genes. There are many thousands of them in the gene, but it's 
specificity, yet it still requires a bunch of factors. So the, the problem was to just keep working and thinking about how to improve the assays and how to look uh, for the event you're trying to understand, but doing some secondary things. We were certainly trying to see cell uh, gene-specific specific transcription from the start. I went to Don Brown's lab as a postdoc because he had the only purified genes in the world, the ribosomal genes. And I had Apollo 1, but it didn't work. So side projects, we started working on the structure. We thought, we thought knowing uh, the composition of the polymerases would be important. That occupied us for several years, but there was a dry period of many attempts, varying conditions of extraction of cells, but, uh, you know, eventually it worked. <laughs> eventually it worked, <laughs> but uh, one had to have faith uh, in one's capabilities uh, to do that. So, uh, well, in those days, the grants weren't as hard to get as they are now. <laughs> <laughs> and I had generous departmental support as well at a private institution, Washington, the, one of the Washingtons in my life, Washington University, St. Louis. But thank you for the question. Yes. Wow. Well. Uh, Perhaps a crass question, but I'm still sitting curious about the article to Nature that got rejected and then two months later accepted with no revisions. I think every researcher in the room would love to know how you achieved well, that. Look, it's a simple story, but of course, in these day and age, in, these, in this day and age, we have third reviewer problems even when it's reviewed. We have second and third reviewer problems. It, it, the simple fact is there were other people trying to identify the polymerases, and it's called competition. And I could actually tell you who reviewed the paper, but I won't. But, <laughs> but the solution was that, uh, not me, because I was a timid Midwesterner still, my mentor talked to the editor, John Maddox, and said, try to understand the situation here. You've published a few weeks ago a trivial paper on RNA polymerase in Nature, not as an article, it's a thing. You know, it was simply advising um, and maybe getting some, maybe the editor got some additional opinion, but how could any knowledgeable person in the field ignore this? I'll do a little history of tracking all the dozens of papers where people were trying to identify this enzyme, but nothing happened. So uh, I don't know what the conversation was, but I know what it would have been if I had. <laughs> you got the outcome. Yes, here's a question. <clears throat> but the key was not having any modifications. <laughs> Thank you. I, sorry, this isn't my area, but I'm, I wonder if I could see if I'm correct in my understanding or misunderstanding. Uh, whether I misunderstand, in the what activates the activators in the right time? Is it the presence of the mediator? I mean, it's, I'm, I'm imagining that the active domain is like floating around. Just generally yeah. Well, right. I, I, there's a level of so you need the basic machinery for every gene, at least transcribed by polymerase too. But it won't do anything by itself. It, the regulation occurs through gene and cell specific factors. You know, some of them are tissue specific, other ones are gene specific, but they're in, they're used in many cells. So having an activator bind to what we call an enhancer or a promoter starts the process. It says this is how we're going to, uh, first of all, open up the chromatin and secondly, get the basic machinery. It's just that it requires a bunch of intermediate factors. So the enhancer that comes along when the gene starts being expressed, is that well, right? Well, the enhancers are, I mean, I didn't go into this, of course, initially we were studying 
promoter elements that are regulatory elements that are close by the transcription start site. But the dilemma these days is that studies from many labs are showing complex enhancers that bind many, many, many transcription factors. And, and they can be distant. They can be 100 kilobases away. But it, the, the gene or cell-specific factors that bind to these so-called enhancers are what really start the process. And, and, and unexpectedly, it involves a lot of intermediates. Uh, you know, you send a mail, you send an envelope to, uh, to somebody and it doesn't go directly, it goes through the post office and five other things. Yes, hi. Okay, Bob, there's an interesting question from online. And it says, uh, I'm a student from India where stressful event, even to manage our academic. How did you manage your stress during the discovery of the polymerase? And how did you motivate yourself during the journey of discovery? <laughs> I'm sure we all want to know the answer to the well, same the, question. The, the first question is, uh, I was stressed. I had friends in the same laboratory and in the department who were getting their PhDs in three or four years. And at the end of four years, I was still, I was doing basic work measuring some of the things I mentioned, but, but had no polymerases. Uh, I can give you a cute anecdote. It was the fear that I might have to go back to the farm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> Farm uh, or no, polymerase. But the answer is, I, I simply knew the question, and I knew there had ultimately to be an answer, mm. and I wasn't forced to, as in the UK, to finish a PhD in four years. I, I took five, but not many students in the US take more. So uh, uh, I, I managed the stress simply by knowing that there would ultimately, hopefully, be a good outcome. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the farm, but be even more stressful. <laughs> but returning to the farm may be... Uh, even more stressful. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a good answer. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, I had support from my mentor, and I had friends in the lab who were, you know, understanding. It didn't mean that I didn't go to a party or two. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, there is a question on the back. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm a graduate student in a chromatin lab, and I'm wondering, after all your accomplishments... Yeah, I'm sorry, which lab? I'm in Tom Milne's lab. Um, ah. Yeah, um, <laughs> my, my adopted scientific <laughs> son. Yes. I, I've heard many stories about you, actually. Um, so after all your accomplishments, what are some questions in the field that still make you want to pick up a pipette and go back to the lab? Uh, well, I, I can tell you one uh, major objective that I would like to see realized in relation to this gentleman's question, it's clear one of the big questions yet is how enhancers really work. And in particular, how they work from long distances. Uh, I don't even care necessarily about super enhancers, super enhancers or locus control regions, just regular enhancers. So uh, one thing I would like to do is to get enhancers functioning in vitro from long distances to activate transcription. We have enhancers, simple ones working from three kilobases for P53 target genes, and, and with all these purified factors plus some unknown factors in a nuclear extract. But, um, well, the, I would actually love to be able to pick up a pipette and go back <laughs> to the lab, but that's out of the question at the moment. <laughs> But, yes, but I think, as, as I said, a, a problem I would like to see solved is to reproduce, even if, even if the answers, in a sense, are really figured out from all the cell-based and the imaging assays, which are all important, I would still like to reproduce it in a test tube. Uh, it's the Feynman philosophy. I can't understand anything unless I can build it. Thank you. Okay. If is there anyone for the last question before we actually allow Bob to go? 
Well, if not, maybe I'll ask you the last question then, Bob. <laughs> I mean, all the transcription factors could turn on and off the same set of target genes. How do they make target selective transcription? Because in reality, they don't do the same in all the cells. So what's your view yeah, on that I'm not that sure way? I understand exactly. I, I mean, I think, first of all, some activators can also be repressors. Yeah. So understanding that, that's a context effect in my view, it, because single factors really generally don't work by themselves. They operate in a community, uh, even a community yeah. of site-specific DNA binding factors. Take the well, local favorite, uh, locus control region. That involves many different uh, yeah. transcription uh, factors. So that, let's do P53. It's close to our heart. <laughs> Use that as an example. P53, all the cells have it. It's the most important tumor suppressor. If it's mutated, 50% of people have that. So in all the cells you have P53, they could turn on and off, in theory, thousands of genes. But in reality, they don't have the same sets of genes tend on and off in the same cells. Some well, cell you get more and some cell you don't. And how do well, you think I, I, that selectivity I, I could about, have worked? I mean, first of all, I just like to get it to function in some context and then understand how it can be modulated. Right. But of course, as you know, as well as any, better than anyone, there are post-translational modifications that mm -hmm. affect it. They might be a different context and as you know, different different insults, different stresses can lead to, uh, you know, different outcomes. But uh, I think that's a big question we still have to answer. How, how do all these things impinge to end up with one specific pathway? When exactly. There are many when there are many yeah. possibilities. Yes. But I think, what, you know, the reductionist biochemist, myself, will start from the ground up and say, what do we need to do to get the, the basic factor working, yeah, and machine. now how do we expand out from there, understand the modulatory mm -hmm. effects? But I think in our field, your field, as you know, the, the issue of cell fate decisions <laughs> and stress responses yeah, is still so a very big, <laughs> big question. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bob. My pleasure. Now, well, hand it you. over. Just very briefly, before you leave the stage, Professor, could you all join me in thanking <laughs> our Kyoto laureate, Bob Roder, for a wonderful beginning to this year's Kyoto Prizes, and Professor Xin Lu for such a wonderful introduction. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Wonderful. And the, just before we close, could I invite you those of you in the room and those of you not in the room, whether online or in person, to join us at five o'clock in the Museum of Natural History, the one where the dinosaurs are, um, for the very special panel discussion that we have e each year. This year, all three laureates telling us what they would say to government leaders if they could say something to them today in these difficult times and reflecting a little bit on what skills they envy in others. So just a more personal conversation with this year's three laureates. It'd be lovely to see you over there in the Natural History Museum. And that will be followed by drinks and canapes and a chance to meet each other. So I just wanted to extend an invitation to all of you to join us for that panel. And if you're online, feel free to join us online, or if you dare to come out in person and join us in person at the Natural History Museum. Once again, a huge thanks to Professor Robert Roder and to Professor Shin Lu for this evening. Well, I have to compliment you.